we'll be inviting Prince Charles Dixon for the keynote address. Sir, if you don't mind, you'll... He's a very busy man. A round of applause. And right after now, he will be leaving to another function on peace. That is the Plato Peace Conference. And it's holding at the same time as this event. So we appreciate him for making our time to be here. Thank you very much. Uh, good morning, wonderful people. Um, I count this as a very big privilege for obvious reasons. Um, let me start by looking to my right and refer to them as my personal persons. <laughs> uh, GTA is home for me. So whatever it is I'm doing tomorrow, again, people have arrested me. I'll be there tomorrow. <laughs> Thank you very much. A round of applause for them. Um, I think uh, it's important to take a minute to do a conversation on them for obvious reasons. And uh, for those of you who are much, much younger, you wouldn't know what 50 years of friendship looks like, I'm sure. 20 years of friendship, 30 years of friendship. Especially these days when friendship happens via social media. I remember I used to know Shake Shake for like five years and had never seen him. And we were supposed to be friends. <laughs> and so I remember the first day I met him. That's social media. Uh, the friendship, the way friendship is, has really, really changed. Um, even during their time, our time, when you didn't meet your friend who was obviously a pen pal, he sent you postage stamps, he wrote you letters, sometimes even sent you his or her currency. Some of us were currency collectors. Uh, but these days, social media, he either sends you his political views or sends you his religious views. <laughs> or abuses you for your religious views. <laughs> uh, and these days, we have all kinds of them. Um, we have social media for APC. We have social media for PDP. We have social media for Fanny Day. <laughs> we have all kinds of social media. And then uh, it's a privilege to have prof in our midst. Um, for some of you seated here, you have not even been alive for 40-something years. How much more being in Nigeria for 40 years? So if you are less than 40, he's been more Nigerian than you. Uh, I don't think um, he will tell you uh, some of us Nigerians can stay that long outside Nigeria. Uh, I spent five years in the U.S. And I came back. I came back because I couldn't break laws. That's the honest reason came back because once there's no light, there's no light. You can't look, you, can, you won't even see the transformer. How much more looking for who will use stick and readjust it. I, I came back because if the light is red and you move. <laughs> Some of us came back because um, it's not buying the cow, it's maintaining the car. <laughs> so for someone to be with us for that long a period and almost become Nigerian, in fact, he is Nigerian because I, I speak to a lot of young people who are Nigerians but can't even speak their own language. Thank you for being a part of us. And uh, for the organizers, thank you for having this conversation. It is important and it has come at no other important time in national life and public discourse and Nigerian and Plato discourse other than now. And for those of us uh, guests, thank you. I always say there is no program without guests. Uh, we wouldn't be having these conversations with ourselves if you were not part of it. Thank you for making our time more so on a Tuesday that you could have been elsewhere. We appreciate each and every one of you. So very quickly, I'm asked to lay the foundation for conversation around social media for peace. But I like to start this way. Rather than look at social media for peace, I want to look at social media as a driver of conflict. So in the early days of social media, for those of us who are Jossites, I still remember with 
very clear precision when we're asked not to eat apples because Muslims had injected it. That message went viral. And when I look at the caliber of people that passed that message and the rational thinking and critical thinking, I ask myself, let's just assume one trailer load of South African pushed apples were coming into Jaws. So I'm thinking the vehicle will stop at Maraba or somewhere and they'll bring all the apples down and start injecting them, injecting them. And then when you're done, you put it back. And then when it gets into Jaws, you make sure it goes only to Christian areas. Man, that must be some hell of a work. But you see, the people that believed it is where I'm concerned. Just tells you how powerful social media can be. In worst cases, social media platforms have been used to suppress internal dissent. I like to look at it, again, from the Twitter battle. There is a day versus we, us versus them. And this is two or three months and counting. Nigerians have been removed from Twitter sphere. Now, there is too strong conversation. I work in the development sector. And uh, I have partners who would say, we know your country is not on Twitter, so we can't do this by Twitter. But there's VPN. So if you want to do it by Twitter, you're turning between being an unpatriotic citizen because it's illegal. But yet, I see politicians who are also making use of Twitter. <laughs> and I'm beginning to ask, what really is internal decent in the perspective of social media? Of course, social media has been known to be used to meddle in democratic elections, incite armed violence, recruit members of terrorist organizations, contribute to crimes across and against humanity. So I've seen people in Bauchi. I think Plato is relatively blessed. It doesn't happen yet. Uh, but we've seen where people have been terrorized by state-sponsored agents but none has gone to prison yet like you have in Katsina, you have in Bauchi, you have in Gombe, uh, and you have in Zamfara. So social media can also drive conflict. There's what we call the echo chambers. The social media acts as an echo chamber. And what an echo chamber does is it's a ploy by the social media companies. Um, I'm sure, David, you're the techie person here. The echo chambers basically survives on bad news. And there's a need for more bad news to generate and drive traffic. And so the echo chambers basically is maximizing profit by growing user engagement for these companies. So if you put out something on Twitter sphere or put out something on YouTube saying just is peaceful, that's no good news. You probably will get two views, three views. I'm sure this is being streamed live, and you're imagining how many people are watching. But if you're going to stream destruction, chaos, conflict, you're going to see a lot of people looking at it. And it's applicable to all social media platforms. Uh, JTA will attest to the fact that they do a lot of developmental work since inception, and they want to do good things. And they say on their Facebook page, do you know 90 people who give us 1,000 naira will amount to 90,000? And you're going to see three likes. One, two, three. And then somebody will manage to comment, the Lord is your strength. <laughs> but if the same JTA puts just on fire, we will kill all the Christians. Every Muslim will come to that page. I don't know how the log reading works, but it works in a way that that's what the echo chamber does. So it still moves from what we call legacy media, the old TV radio system where, of course, if Professor Jewett is beat by a dog, no story. But if he bites a dog, we'll add everything. White man who wears glasses, man, the guy bite the dog. Not just guy who, oh, what's going to happen for that just? You just be seeing, you go and urinate and come back, you see 2,300 comments. Ah, the guy was in a do. No wonder, and I do that. Now nah, nah, they are do connection. But if you write, he promotes peace. I wouldn't he? Isn't he a white man? 
You don't see crisis. Four comments. Case closed. There's no echo. And it's sad. But again, that's where we are. And you see, these virtual echo chambers helps radicalize users' world views. I've seen Shake make some very, 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 and I emphasize that very, very balanced conversation on the ethno-religious conflicts on Joss. And then you see people who have never been to any Arab country start to tell you in Egypt where he's schooled. And I'm sure he's smiling, but you have not gone to the Egypt. I'm the one who's gone to the Egypt. But these are views that are radicalized. You know, I remember only recently Trump, Capitol Hill, and the Congress. And people were like, it will soon happen in Nigeria. It will soon happen. And those views were only a view of what they just saw. Somebody said, Fanny Coyote, and I'll be talking about him a lot. A man who has four wives, five wives. He has been leaving one for the other. What do you people expect? That he'll be leaving parties for parties. And where I was, I remember the person talking about it at the last time had 16 concubines. In his own world, he's also a Fanny Coyote. So these echo chambers work the way they are. We've seen the social media play a role in voter manipulation, offline violence, what we call pigeonholing of information. So for example, I'm talking now, I'm sure it's being recorded, somebody will just take that part where I said Fanny Karadi has four wives. And he will keep repeating it, four wives, four wives, four wives, four wives. Then you see on that, the guy talking has 15. You pigeonhole the information to suit what you want. Sadly, social media can kill. We've seen rumors kill. We've seen fake online news about specific people that have prompted other people to take justice into their hands. So if I ask two, three minutes from where we all seated, did anybody die yesterday? From my office, I hear two PLA police students died. I hear no, it's one. The government says people were injured. Who do we believe? I can tell you 92% of the people who have one information or the other were not here yesterday. They had to rely on the social media space. Sadly, social media has become a behavior modification system. We have what we call the power of dogs that are experimented in real time. So people are a function of social media. You can sit down in a village in Pangshin and wear a shirt that's written mobile. And mobile means by, for them, for us. And it's a, an acculturization of a place you have never been. And that's what social media does. Social media also has an interference in conflict dynamics. You find out that there are two kinds of just. There is just where we all live in, where we all reside in, the just where we see what happens. And then we have the JTA just, the just we once knew. And then there is a just as it is, and there's a just we want. Incidentally, there's a social media just. The social media just is the one where you are in Abuja. Correct me if I'm wrong. Somebody say you are going to just. Oh boy. Let's say, as you don't reach 50, but it only do you to die, ba? Huh? Eh? You won't go just. Leave those people low. It is a just where Daily Trust screams a headline in the militia group. And I mean just. I didn't even know that there was an Irigwe militia arm. You know? And uh, it is a social media creation that has led the conversation of the Fulani headsmen. See, today nobody wants to say the full and doctor. Nobody wants to say the full and nurse. Nobody wants to say the full and preacher. Nobody wants to say the full and lawyer. It's a full, in fact, it becomes so worse that for 10,000 naira, I told an academic, can you tell me the difference between Kanuri and full and? He said, oh, they are the same. They are the same. And I said, how are they the same? He said, they are all fair. So, if I get killed in one of these conflicts, don't be surprised I was killed because I was Fulani. 
These are conversations that the social media has twisted the complexity of the conversation. That is why we call it an interference. It is also increasingly clear that even well-meaning social media campaigns can be interfered into conflict dynamics. Salis will tell you that when they do good, people say, after all, Baturi has given you money. That's why. If not, a young man in Africa, who is giving people money for this? That's the social media conversation. People don't want to listen to Shake Shake because it's just Shake. You know? So these are perceptions that interfere in our rational way of thinking. Moving further to the core conversation, social media as a tool for peace, social media for peace. So I'd like to say very quickly that you see, social media is a two-edged sword. It depends on how you dangle it. I look at the risk that social media poses for peace builders and humanitarian efforts, what JTA, uh, JTA does, what Prof does in the academia, what Young Man is doing, what Sheikh does, what Benedict does, what my brother does in substance abuse withdrawal, what uh, Face of Peace does. It's a two, two-edged sword. And the reason why we look at it from that is there are individuals who are working in projects with colleagues from countries that are considered not friendly. And let me quickly play an explanation to that. I have an organization that we partner with. And you'll be surprised. Another organization whom we partner with is the King Abdulaziz Center for Intercultural Dialogue. Now, this other organization will not touch money from the other organization because it is King Abdulaziz. And we're supposed to be having conversations in peace. As far as they are concerned, the money is Islamic. And then this other organization will not touch money from the other organization, which is doing wonderful work in orphanage. I'm happy that a politician, a young politician, just sat down and he was part of a conversation, Madhu Madhu, who is running a scholarship program as part of his campaign. There's nothing politicians won't promise you, but I'm sure he's fulfilling his welcome. And they said, ah, I don't mind that Madhu Madhu guy. He has collected church money. He will convert people. These are the conversations. Convert them to what? To Christians. So make sure that our Muslim brothers are not part of that scheme. Now, these interference and knowledges, and knowledge base rather, are functions of what the social media creates. So there are people who we know according to the gospel of social media. There are social media humanitarians, and there are real humanitarians. So for example, as a donor person, I sit down and I see proposals where those seeking funds talk about the wonderful work they've done in Basa. And I'm asking myself, is it the same Basa I know, or is another Basa? Sadly, these are the things that social media does, positively, negatively. There is then the policy response to social media disinformation campaigns. And I hope that the, uh, the panelists would find time to look at this. I do support a regulated social media space. And coming from a person like me, you wonder, what is regulation? Regulation is a commandment. A system without a policy structure is not a system. Often than not, you walk into a bank and you want to open an account and they give you a document. You're in a hurry to go to the end and just sign. Let them just open the account. It never worries you until there's a problem you discovered you signed away your liberty. From time to time, Google sends me a mail and says we've updated our copyright rules and all that. I take the pain to go through 13, 14, 22 pages. For those of you who are Apple users, when you're updating, they will always tell you, look at the new terms. We just press so that you can just update. You don't even know if they've sold your mother or they've bought your father for a loan fee. Africans are like that. Hide something and then no one's going to bother to find it. And social media has become that kind of space. I was telling a couple of young persons the other day, if you're a Jossite, of course, there are two kinds of Jossites. There is today's Jossite University of Joss, and then there's the old Jossite University of Joss, and then there are the Jossites. 
In the old University of Joss, there were some courses, depending on your department, for me, psychology, those particular courses, if you walked into the library, there's only one book for that course. If you read that book, you have read the whole course. If you can memorize it, you will surely pass. Fast forward to about 25 years now, that same course, if you just put that word in Google, you're going to see 1 million 300 and something entries. Where do you start reading from? And for people who at that time couldn't read one book, how would they read 1 million entries on that particular subject matter? So the social media provides a place to hide in our quest for peace. And the only persons and people who can respectfully do something about it is the approach policy response from our stakeholders give to this. And the reason for this and why I dwell on regulation is because we need to have conversations around punitive approaches. So we have closed Twitter and we're in a country that 70% of the population is a youthful population. And out of that 70%, a considerable amount of that percentage make their resources from social media. So if you're discussing unemployment and then you close a source of employment, it makes absolutely no sense. And so policy state actors need to look at it and find out what is the best punitive measures that can be used. Now, in that regard also, it is important to look at code of conducts and look at resilience building. And I think the panelists will do very well in terms of that. I've seen conversations in Plato originated and Plato based platforms, such as the intelligentsia, such as movement for Plato heritage, just as, such as welcome to Joss, where when you look at the conversation, sometimes it's tilted towards who's more Joss than the other. <laughs> And then you find a lot of hazardous contents. Sometimes somebody says it's important to have a social media fast where you get off the social media for a day or two or else you die before your time. You've also had the issue of clowned personas and all that. Of course, people argue that regulation will lead to censorship. And then we argue that at what stage does agitations of opposition become censorship? There's a thin line between freedom of expression and free speech. And these are conversations I think that the panelists are well capable of taking along their stride. Social media companies are also very much important in this conversation. There needs to be a re, re, um, uh, what I will refer to as an asymmetric relationship between social media companies and Nigeria, judging the peculiarity of Nigeria. So with an expertise for myself in hate speech, dangerous speech, inflammatory speech, speech that's capable of causing conflict, we also look at stereotypical speeches and the understanding. And so a couple of years ago, with the Institute for Peace in the United States, we developed through Peace Tech what we call a hate speech vocabulary for Nigeria. But we discovered that this vocabulary is transitory. So what could be insultive in 2011 could be a joke in 2014. I was somewhere only yesterday and they kept telling myself and the older ones like Salis that we'll go soon Dorime, we'll go Dorime. So I was like, and when they said it, then everybody will laugh. So I was wondering, what is Dorime? You know, smile. And when they say we'll go soon Dorime, the younger ones will laugh. At this time, I said, let me laugh so that I don't look at me. Uh -huh. You know? But at the same time, I was looking for somebody close to ask, how are we going to Dorime? You know? And by the time I got the meaning of Dorime, I was all laughs. But you see, at that point, if I said that to a more and more older person, we go Dorime, he might take it as an insult. I had barely finished understanding Dorime before somebody told me, after the Dorime, there will be doings. And I'm like, doings? So these vocabularies are there and they could mean anything and of course prince madu madu will tell you that there is a clear distinction between being fat huge and big it depends on the use at one point i have also been told that guy that guy will carry dread like madman 
And somebody has said, Kai, beautiful dread. It is the context. And that is how social media spaces operate, even when the conversation is for peace. As a roundup, and wish us a very, very fruitful gladiation around this conversation around social media and peace. Let me say that social media has enhanced the understanding of the root causes, scale, and impact of potential harmful content and of effectiveness of the tools to address it. So if the image is wrong, there is a reverse image to look at it to find out. It has also improved the coping of potential harmful content online. So interestingly, let me bust a bubble. The young man seated there is one of the characters I've studied for the past three years. And he's surprised. I've studied him via social media without ever meeting him until now. So social media can give you a character that is not even yours. So if I said by his social presence, he doesn't smile. I'm surprised he has laughed. If I say by his social presence, he's always laughing. If he frowns, I might be disappointed. And that's how it is. Enhancing promotion and support of peace-building narratives and initiatives through digital technologies and social media. So, for example, I'm proud of the fact that he's going with a lesser-known Young People's Democratic Party as against the big two. That is the kind of conversation you can have in changing the narratives. So his consistency, despite being a one-time APC warlord, is smiling, tells you that social media for peace can be a tool that is well, well harnessed. It can help spread peace, encouraging dialogue among people from different ethnic backgrounds and nationalities. So let me say this, in case you don't know, Facebook is one continent and a half. That's a billion plus counting. YouTube is another con continent on its own. WhatsApp is another continent on its own. Instagram is actually two continents on her own. So imagine different nationalities, different people. Some of us actually went to Obikubana's barrier by social media. I had never been there. So you can imagine the kind of countries and places you go to without being ever there. And that's the power of social media. So we need to understand that there's a time bomb in every of this social media platform we find ourselves. And as Africans, we have moved beyond the age where, of course, you needed a laptop or a computer. I used to make fun of my beloved Jaws. Only 20-something years ago, there were only two places you could find a desktop in the whole of Plateau State. Very, very funny. NVRI VOM and the Meteorological Center, not even University of Joss, were the only places that had a, la a, I mean, a desktop. And I find that of VOM um, very exciting. The desktops were there, but they covered it. And anytime you visit, they will show you. They will remove it, show you when you go, they cover it again. But today, some of us have mothers and grandmothers that wake up in the morning and they go to Facebook just to see if their children in just are alive. That's where we are. And it's quite interesting to know that the WHO states in terms of statistics that the number of mobile sm smart devices ownership in Africa is more than the population of the whole of America, South America, and Europe put together. So you can imagine the damage we can actually do to the world just by the mobile handset you have in your hands. I dare say to you that again, these tools provide, of course, a social mobilization for peaceful protests and democracy. Of course, the conversation will remain as to how successful was the NSAS, but it was a mobilization that the social media facilitated. It will remain a tool as a technology that has created opportunities for people to mobilize politically in defense of democracy and human rights. Yes, and on the social spectrum, it will also be a tool that people have used to meet each other. I see people who have gotten married through social media. I see people who have become best buddies through social media. I see people who are Jossites who sell their goods and services outside Joss by friendship and rapport they've built through social media. And interestingly, the other way around, like I said, ab initial. We've seen people create an enormous level of hatred 
for people they don't know but social media. And that's how funny life can be. My prayers with us and for each and every one of us is as social media spaces advance that we live in a future of a Nigeria that integrates its social differences, its differences in culture, its differences in faith, its differences in ethnography, geography, into one solid instrument of technology for advancement. It hurts a few of us that in 2021, in places like Dubai, technology is trying to harness how they can be dictators of their own fortune by determining when it rains. But here we are discussing VAT, discussing secessionist conversation, all because we do not have the best of leadership. I like to say this in conclusion. When Zuckerberg visited Buhari, it was like a continent visiting a nation. But he visited Buhari not as a nation. He visited as a potential businessman and what 200 million in terms of population could harness for his business. The moment Nigerian leadership starts to see the prospect of a people that are well endowed in human resources, in creative forces, the better for us. A section of this hall will soon die. Whether we like it or not, me, Salis, my brother, we will soon, we can, I told somebody that we will die before 2071. He said, God forbid. I said, you are already 50. Do you know what 2071 is? I can't be here 2071. There's no God forbid about it. But you see, where I am, I want to smile and say that I was a citizen of a country that became a new world in harnessing a change. Thank you very much, distinguished gentlemen.